of what you're about to experience. So please welcome one of our soloists this evening, Lisa Jaskone. So because she has to go and get ready for uh, the concerto, uh, I'll start talking about the Hinastera Harp Concerto, uh, which was written in 1965. Did this thing go off? Hello, hello. Is this okay? No. All right. I think I'm gonna have to do this old school. Did I turn something? Is that, oh, yikes. Okay, we're back. We're back online. Uh, the Hinastera Harp Concerto, written in 1965, specifically written for Edna Phillips, who was the longtime legendary harpist for the Philadelphia Orchestra. Uh, to give you a little background about Miss Phillips, who actually died in 2003, Miss Phillips uh, started learning the piano, and then, oh, it's gone. Okay. <laughs> She was originally a piano player when she began her musical career, and after that, uh, she decided to pick up the harp and was such a talented harpist that she started studying at the newly created Curtis Conservatory of Music in Philadelphia, and after only five years, in 1930, her teacher, the legendary Carlos Salcedo, arranged for her to have a private audition with the music director of the Philadelphia Orchestra, Leopold Spokowski, and in hopes that she would be hired as the second harpist of the Philadelphia Orchestra. To everyone's surprise, Miss Phillips did such a great job that Stokowski on the spot gave her the principal harpist position. <laughs> and Miss Phillips, of course, became legendary not only because she was a member of the great Philadelphia Orchestra in its great heyday, not only through the Stokowski years, but also through the Eugene Ormandy years. All of the great recordings any harp is Miss Phillips. More importantly, Miss Phillips made a point of trying to expand the repertoire for Hartman Orchestra. So a lot of the great 20th century concertos were actually written for her. She was very, very hands-on about raising the money and convincing Eugene Ormandy and the Philadelphia Orchestra to make sure that they gave her chances to commission works. This was the last of these commissions in 1965. But here's a little caveat. The commission came in 1956. The premiere was in 1965. <laughs> One of the main reasons the piece took so long to write, this is a very complicated instrument. And outside of the great French composers like Debussy and Ravel, who really understood, and maybe Lisha might not agree with me, but I think they are the ones that really know how to write for the instrument, Hinastera really didn't know what to do. He liked the idea of writing, but I think he did not know enough about the instrument, so he kept putting it off. He put it off too much to the point that when 1965 came around, Miss Phillips had already retired from the orchestra. So she was not the person that played the premiere. It's not all so bad. She was at the premiere. The piece actually is dedicated to her, but because of timing issues, she did not play the piece. The premiere was taken over by the great Nicanor Zabaleta, the great Spanish harpist, who actually, at, towards the process, helped and worked with Inastera closely basically showing him what is possible on the instrument. Like you, for many, many years, I used to think of the instrument as this angelic instrument that you just wave your arms and that's it. But trust me, this is a very, very complicated piece of equipment. Plus, it is also a big piece of furniture. And there are many things that you can do with it. So, welcome, Leisha. The first thing that I want you to notice, and that most people don't know, is that this instrument actually has seven pedals. So, can you tell us what the pedals do? <laughs> well, the harp is basically a diatonic instrument, so the strings that you see, they play like the C major scale. Um, so, to make the sharps and the flats, we use the pedals. So, there is one pedal for each pitch in the scale. Uh, so, seven pedals. And I'll just demonstrate. So this is the C, this red string. So there's a C flat. Now it's natural, and now it's sharp. So I'm playing the same string. I'm just moving the pedal, and that changes the pitch. If you see so, the mechanics over here, it just literally is yes. just moving the string. <laughs> yes, yeah, so these, these little um, discs, they tighten or loosen the string, thereby changing the pitch. Okay. Uh, one of the effects that you do in this piece is actually glissando with the pedal. Can yes, you show yes. a little bit of what it's not like? Oh, sure. Yeah. 
glissando while playing. Now, another one of the effects that comes around, which is fascinating, of course, we mostly know the harp as the glissando. If you were to play a regular, would you mind? I'm sorry, I need to ask you to do that. It's my favorite. Every time I see it, I cannot help it. I always have to do it. I shouldn't tell you this, but I can't help it. I told you. It puts a smile on your face. I say, yeah, you see? You just made a lot of new friends. One of the other effects that he asks you is to do that same thing, but with your fingernails, right? Well, talking about percussion, you also use the instrument as a percussion instrument. Can you? So talk about double, quadruple, triple duty, you know. Uh, one of my favorite effects, and I told you kind of caught me off guard, is the glissando on one string. Yeah, it's a, a whistle. Whistle. Yeah, I'm, again, going back to the whole idea of what the instrument is capable of doing, you can see why Hinastero was scared out of his mind to write for this instrument. You know, plus there are things that you have to understand how the pedals work and what is actually possible to play. Now, you guys actually have a, a, a language that you put in your parts about how the pedals should be situated, right? I mean, is that universal? Um, yes, I think that is universal. I, I mean, different harpists notate it perhaps with different kind of marks, yes. but basically it's a diagram that shows you where the pedals are positioned at any point in the piece. Every time we were rehearsing, literally, we had to take a little bit of time when I said, okay, let's start at this section, where literally she had to take a moment to figure out where the pedals were supposed to be. Each of the pedals has three positions, and multiply that times seven, it's a lot of stuff to move. So, I mean, it's, it's amazing even for me as a conductor to come to realize what the actual logistical needs of the instrument are. Uh, which other effect, oh, playing next to the fingerboard. Is that a, you can play, usually 90% of the times you play in the middle of the, of, 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 the, of the string, but at times you have to play close to the fingerboard. If you were to play that in, let's say, normally, Now, one of the most popular effects, I think, for the harp is actually the harmonics that you can produce from the instrument. And there's, there's one part in the, in the cadenza of this piece where um, we're playing a glissando with one hand and harmonics in the air. You might want to, you might want to you. Okay. There is one uh, beautiful, beautiful spot in the cadenza uh, where the harpist is playing harmonics in the left hand, and that's the melody. And meanwhile, it's accompanied by the right hand gl glissandi. So I'll play a little bit of that to give you an idea. <laughs> Cover all of the effects? Are we missing any? Oh, the pedal slides. Oh, the pedal slides, of course. It's <laughs> a so percussive effect. Yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> you thought you had to be busy just with your with your hands, but uh, obviously, you know, the feet get a lot of involvement. Um, do you agree that perhaps when this piece was written, I mean, I'm sure Sabaleta had a lot to say yeah. 
to show. I mean, because it, it, especially in the cadenza, these seems almost written by a harp player for another harp player. I mean, do you agree with that? Yes, it's, it's very idiomatic and it shows off the harp very well. And uh, it is uh, known that Zabaleta did go to Argentina to visit with Hinastera to uh, help extract the piece from him. <laughs> so. Yeah, Hinastera was known, like some composers, they need inspiration. You know, many composers require a little bit of inspiration and uh, with a piece, with I think an instrument that is not, that is unusually complicated, I, I think that, that he needed the expertise of a harpist that would definitely share with him what was possible. And in many ways, I could probably tell, give him an idea of what he could write. In the end, this piece, I think, is one of the most uh, performed, I think, in the harp repertoire. I mean, there's quite a few. Mozart wrote one of the most famous, the flute and, and, and harp concerto. Uh, there's also the, the Rein, Reinhold Glier uh, concerto. Uh, there are a bunch of French composers that also wrote for the instrument. But I would say the Hinastera being because it is a Argentinian composer, I think he utilizes the harp almost in a way that South American harpists would do it. So it's not your standard Russian, French academic harp in many ways because of all of the things that she's asked to do. Uh, the instrument almost becomes a folk instrument. You know, and I think uh, tonight when you hear it with the orchestra, it's an actual, not only incredible oral experience, but it's more importantly a very visual thing to watch the harpists have to manage all of these uh, different uh, tricks that, uh, or minefields that, that Mr. Hinastera put right in front of you. So I think you're going to enjoy the piece. Leisha, thank you so much for joining us and uh, we'll enjoy your performance. Now, while they put the that thing away and uh, your, your, mo your mom must have had a really big minivan, right? Harp mom. Well, her mom was a harpist uh, as well, so I guess it came with the DNA. So they kind of knew that they needed a big car. So. Thank you, Leisha. This entire program, as I finished talking about the Hinastera, is about folk music. And how composers, even though they might be classically trained, serious academic composers going to conservatoires in Paris and in New York, trying to learn how to write like Bach, can never escape who they are and where they come from. And the music that you're going to hear tonight, particularly in three pieces, you're going to see that connection of how composers cannot escape their backgrounds, their nationalistic urges. We're opening tonight with a piece by the Hungarian composer, Sultan Kodai. Sultan Kodai, along with Béla Bartók, I would say are the two most important composers of the 20th century in Hungary. Remember that Hungary, for many years, and through hundreds of years actually, has changed hands politically and geographically. The most famous part of their moment was when they were part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. And this is where Kodai, it was actually after World War I where everything fell apart, but Kodai grew up in the Austria, when he was part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire, and then when he became uh, independent, and more importantly, trying to find its own identity. I always say that Kodai and Béla Bartók are musical twins. These two composers had basically the same ideas in mind about what Hungarian music should be, but they took it even further. These composers did something that I think of as probably the first time that this was ever attempted. Both Kodai and Bartok felt that there was so much richness in the musical history of the villages in Hungary that they needed to somehow preserve it. They needed to rescue it. Because remember, many of the songs and the things, music that people played and sang in the little villages in the middle of nowhere were passed down from generation to generation orally from mother to son, from grandmother to granddaughter, everything was transmitted just by singing it to each other. And there was nothing written. And these, many of these songs were you know, hundreds or maybe even thousands of years old. So Kodai and Bartok did something very unusual. They actually utilized modern technology. The newly created recorded gramophones. You've seen them, the big thing with the big speaker. And they went all over Austria-Hungary with these things into little villages. And if you go on, 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 on the internet, you will find pictures of Kodai standing on this thing, cranking this machine, while this lady with her big dress in the middle of nowhere would be singing into the speaker. And thus, Kodai would be preserving 
many of these songs. Over many years that this took place, he was actually able to collect over a thousand songs from all over Hungary. So this guy took nationalistic pride a little bit further than most people did. You know who originally wanted to do that? Franz Liszt in the 19th century originally wanted to do the same thing. Somehow he knew the richness of the musical history. The problem is that Franz Liszt was very busy conquering Europe with his good looks and his piano playing and having ladies passing out during his performances. <laughs> so he never got around it. Franz Liszt was the one that came uh, after Franz Liszt, I guess, failed in his duty. It was Kodai and Bartók who uh, saved it. So anytime that you hear the music of Sultan Kodai and Bela Bartók, you have to think of it from the prism of his trips to these small villages. Because even though he was very classical trained, he actually went to the conservatory in Paris, his music is inescapably Hungarian. Tonight we open with a piece that is a suite from an opera, an, a comic opera that he wrote in 1926 called Har Janos. And the best way that I can give you the five minute Cliff Notes version of the plot of Har Janos, it is the Hungarian version of Don Quixote. <laughs> this idea of this idealistic man who has big dreams about himself and who in his mind is incredibly powerful, a uh, wonderful man of love and letters, and who can by himself conquer entire armies. But this is all in his head. The suites that you're going to hear tonight are actually the greatest hits from this opera. Something that is inescapably Hungarian, and tonight you're in for a special treat. Not only are we hearing the unusual aspect of having a harp concerto, this piece is so Hungarian that it actually requires a Hungarian instrument that very few people in the world can actually play. We actually have it here in Nashville tonight. The instrument is called a cimbalom. The cimbalom is a Hungarian instrument that the best way that I can describe it is actually looks like an open piano with strings and you play it with sticks. It is actually a percussion instrument, it's going to be right in front of me, and this instrument is 100% Hungarian. And in the score, Mr. Kodai requests an actual cimbalom player. That is why this piece doesn't get played very often, because there's only very few people in the world, not that can play the instrument, more importantly, that can actually follow a conductor, and more importantly, that can actually read music. Because this is an instrument that is steeped in folk music, and you're supposed to improvise on it, you know, and play on your own with a small, with a small group. There was no idea of having a cimbalom player follow a conductor and sit in the middle of an orchestra. So finding those two things is very unusual. And the person that is playing it tonight, Larry Captain, has actually made a career, or a side career, of playing the cimbala. Most likely over the last 30 years, every recording of Hari Janos that exists, 90% of the time is him playing it. He's actually currently the dean of the School of Music at Louisiana State University. Former percussionist, but he learned, I, don't, I need to ask him about this, how he learned to play this instrument. Uh, but like I said, it looks like an open piano and you play on the strings and it has a very unique sound, uh, very unique color. Sometimes it adds solos, but many times it adds just a texture to the sound. The piece is divided into six movements. The first movement is a prelude and it is entitled The Fairy Tale Begins. But it starts in a very Hungarian way. It starts with a sneeze. The orchestra actually tries to replicate the sound of a sneeze because in Hungarian folklore, when you're about to tell a story, if you sneeze beforehand, the story's got to be true. <laughs> the second movement um, is actually uh, the Viennese musical clock. And this one is very magical because you hear um, literally the way that he recreates the sound of a very, very large clock in the palace of Vienna. In the story, Hari Janos, who comes from Hungary, the empress, the wife of the emperor, falls in love with him. And is so madly in love with Hari Janos that actually takes him and his wife to Vienna. And while he's in Vienna, he's fascinated by the sights and sound. The third movement is actually a song, and this is where the cimbalom first makes the appearance. Every time you hear the cimbalom, it, it is to showcase the melancholy and the homesickness that Hari Janos and his wife Orse felt when they were away from their homeland. So every time you hear this instrument, it is to represent that homesickness that we can all sometimes relate to. The third movement, uh, sorry, the fourth movement is 
the battle and defeat of Napoleon. You see in the story, the minister of Napoleon is also in love with the emperor's wife. And because he knows that she's in love with Haryanas, the only way that he can fix it is by invading Austria. <laughs> and this is where Haryanas, all by himself, defeats the entire army of Napoleon. <laughs> you were here, the trombones, announcing the call to battle. But that French uh, march of triumph at the end of the movement becomes a funeral march. The fifth movement is another very Hungarian piece of music. It's actually a chardas, which is a very fast dance. Again, the cimbalom shows up, and you cannot help but to feel like you're somewhere in the middle of Hungary. The last movement is the procession of the emperor and his court. Pomp, brilliance, and it is at this point that Hari Janos realizes that he could never be happy there, and that the only place for him is back home with his wife, Orsay. It is a comic opera, the music is very light, but the orchestration is incredibly magical. Particularly pay attention beyond the cymbalum to all of the percussion instruments that he required. And in two movements, actually, the strings don't play. They just sit there. It is written specifically for a brass band, percussion, and three piccolos. <laughs> it's a wonderful way to tell the story. After this intermission, we play the Mozart's Piano Concerto number nine. Mozart and his piano concerto, which are 27 of them, I would say from 19 to 27 are the ones that are the most popular. They are the ones from his mature old period when he was 30. <laughs> <laughs> this one, I think, he was old. He was 21 when he wrote this one. So when somebody died in 35, 36, yeah, he was, he was getting there. This concerto, written when he was 21 years old, 1777, it is entitled Jeune Homme. Jeune Homme, of course, means young man. But it is much later that we came to realize that Jeune Homme is actually a person. Through a lot of research and scholars came to find out that the subtitle Jeune Homme was actually given for the person for whom the piece was written. This concerto has many firsts in it. This is a concerto that broke with a lot of tradition. I'll tell you one by one what they are. First and foremost, 95% of the concertos that Mozart wrote for piano were written for himself, for him to play. This one he wrote for somebody else. And here's the best part. The name Jeune Homme is wrong. Completely and utterly wrong. The person that wrote this in, 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 the, published, in, the, in the first published uh, version of this got the name completely wrong. This is the 1700s. You cannot blame them for that. I mean, said, oh, who was the name of the piano? Okay. Even nowadays, we don't know the name. Nowadays, we think it might be Gemini. It might be Gemini. It might be Gemini. We don't know. But for historical purpose, it will forever be known wrongly as Genome. Personally, I like to refer to her as Mrs. Miss J. Another thing, it's a female pianist. 1777, to have a soloist, a piano soloist, who, female piano soloist, was very unusual. She was making a career, and apparently, we do know that somehow she was going through Salzburg in 1777. Somehow, we know that her father knew Mozart's father, Leopold, and that's how the connection was made for Mozart to write this piece for her. Something else that is very unusual. The cadences in every concerto in the 1700s, and even all the way through Beethoven, the cadences were supposed to be improvised. This is the moment where the orchestra stops and the pianist just can go all crazy, or the violinist, whoever the soloist, and improvise on the cadenza. This concerto, all the cadenzas are written out, which tells me that Miss J could not improvise. So Mozart had to actually write the cadenzas for her. The piece breaks with tradition from the beginning. In most concertos of Mozart, you play the opening, long orchestra plays the introduction, the pianist is sitting there, <laughs> boom, and then finally the pianist comes in. Not here, the orchestra plays one measure, boom, the pianist comes in. I can just see the poor ladies at the audience dropping their program books. It's wrong. 
The piano is only placed for two measures, and then they sit down, then they sit back. <laughs> but already they break with tradition. But normally, you get the orchestra to play the opening, they finish the little thing, plum, 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 and then the pianist comes in. No, nope, not here. The orchestra is getting comfortable, and again, the pianist breaks in in the middle and say, okay, stop it. I, I, I need to play. You know? What else? Oh, at times in this piece, which is written for string, two oboes, and two horns, there's times when the strings don't play at all, and you have piano and two oboes. Piano and two French horns. I mean, who writes that? Mozart. <laughs> and to break even more with tradition, the pianist plays the cadenza, and again, you're supposed to play the cadenza and then sit out. No, plays the cadenza and then continues playing into the end of the first movement. This guy is arrogant. This little kid, Mozart, 21 years old, you know, it's almost like he's thumbing his nose at tradition, saying, you know what, I like your little old rules, but it's a new, there's a new sheriff in town. Second movement, first thing, it's in a minor key. Of all the 27 concertos, this is the only one, of, along with another one, that the middle movement is actually in a minor key, which gives you a more melancholy, almost sad feel to it. It's very heavy, almost. But here's where Mozart kind of made a connection with the past. To me, this middle movement sounds more like Bach. This is where he's looking back and saying, you know, Bach was good. We should not forget where we came from. Because in many times, this concerto at times sounds like almost like a Bach harpsichord sonata, especially in the writing. Very, very simplistic. But because it is in a minor key, it gives you a more melancholy feel. Again, the cadenza is written out. And again, after the cadenza, the orchestra is supposed to come in. No, the cadenza is over and the pianist continues playing by herself. And then the orchestra finally finished the piece off, the, the second movement. The last movement is a comic opera. The last movement is vintage Mozart. Begins with the piano by, by himself. The orchestra doesn't even play for the first 45 measures. Just the pianist. We do know, because of the way that this was written, that Miss J must have been one heck of a pianist. Because even by 21st century standards, this is a tough piece. And you know what she must have been really good at? Trills. There are a lot of them in this piece. And what I mean a lot, a lot. You want to talk about specifically when a soloist writes a piece for a, for a particular soloist, they want to bring out their best abilities. This is probably something that Miss J was good at and Mozart included. This whole movement is also weird. You get comfortable and then in the middle of it, he throws a minuet. In the middle of nowhere, the piece almost comes to a halt and then he adds a completely new movement almost. It's like a movement within a movement, this little minuet, which sounds like a string quartet. It's so out of character. And then again, he recovers back into the, op the, the, the comic opera. Many scholars and many historians will tell you that this is probably the first great piano concerto of the repertoire. This is the piece that opened the door for everything that came after. And more importantly, this is probably the piece that made Mozart, Mozart. This is the piece that established what was to come. Stylistically, compositionally, psychologically, everything. And you know what? Piano concerto number nine, it's actually the longest of his concertos. 30 minutes long. All the other ones are 25, 26. This one is the most substantial. Not bad for a 21-year-old kid. The last piece on the program, go back to folk music. This time, Mayan, Mexican, Aztec folk music. Carlos Chavez was probably the most important Mexican composer of the 20th century. You remember a few weeks ago, a few, maybe last month, we did the Salon Mexico of Copeland. And you remember that Copeland got the inspiration because he was taken to a dance hall in Mexico City. Well, the guy that took him, Carlos Chavez. Carlos Chavez and Aaron Copeland were partying together a lot. And El Salon Mexico premiered in 1937. The Sinfonia India that you're going to hear tonight premiered in 1936 by the Columbia Broadcasting Orchestra and Carlos Chavez conducted. Remember back in the days when uh, NBC and all the radios, they had their own orchestras. The Columbia Broadcasting Orchestra commissioned this piece. Carlos Chavez was not only active musically, he was also very active politically. And he actually founded the first three professional symphony orchestras in Mexico. He was the founding conductor. 
and he was also for a while Minister of Culture, very active in the government in Mexico, but more importantly, maintained a very busy conducting and compositional schedule. He wrote seven symphonies altogether. This is actually number two, and is better known as the Sinfonia India. The piece is in one movement, continues, 10 minutes long. It's a very short symphony, but what's amazing is that it utilizes actual Aztec and indigenous material and instruments to perform this work. And you think the chimbalum is cool? Wait until you hear these Mayan instruments that we're gonna throw at you. These instruments, back there, the percussion section this week, to me, looks more like a museum. <laughs> I will tell you that uh, this may have made me very proud because our percussion section has gone really way beyond their, their uh, call of duty because not only did they manage to get the instruments, but in some cases actually had to build the instruments and then have to learn how to play them. You see, the percussion requirements for this piece, Mr. Chavez wanted actual indigenous instruments, and he calls for them. Instruments like teponaxles, instruments like water gourd drum, instruments like deer hoof uh, rattles, and, and butterfly cocoon rattles, and rattles that you're supposed to wrap around your, your, your waist and then dance. You've seen it. But he realized also that how many orchestras have access to these things? So he would say, well, if you don't have teponaxles, fine, play it on a xylophone. Boring. <laughs> if you know how to be play it on the bass drum. Boring. Tonight, you're in for a treat. You're going to hear the piece the way, actually, that Chavez intended. All of the instruments in the percussion, except for the timpani, which is the one that we all recognize. All of the other percussion instruments are actual yaqui instruments from the northern part of Mexico. Some of them were actually built here, but they look very indigenous, and they sound very indigenous. I won't go too much into it because tonight at the performance, while they're lowering the piano, we'll do a little show and tell, which I think you will definitely appreciate. This music is 100% folk music from the northern part of Mexico. It is going to put you back into the times of the conquistadors in many cases. The music at times can be very exuberant, very fast, danceable, and at times it can be very primitive, almost like a rite of spring of Stravinsky where the drums are leading the way. You're gonna hear calls from the French horns, almost like if you see this big horn and they're calling you to battle or calling you to eat, I don't know. You're gonna hear the sounds of piccolos, you're gonna hear the sound of woodwinds, the strings playing on of the, on their, their, their strings is non-academic, almost trying to imitate the sound of mariachi music in many cases. This whole program, I have to tell you, was concocted almost in a lab. Remember that when I program music, a lot of it is like our ideas that, for me, this music, you can see there's an obvious connection, folksy connection between them. But you never know whether they're going to work in the actual performance. And I do have to tell you that after running the rehearsal, and even this morning in the dress rehearsal, they do connect. There is a real sense, at least personally, you might disagree, but there's a real sense to me that this music is first and foremost human. As I said when I started this evening, this is music that comes from the soul. That even if these composers at times leave their country and go study in other places with other musical techniques, deep inside in each and every one of these artists is a, a, a need to reflect where they come from. And I think by the end of this evening, you're gonna to come to appreciate how these composers were able to very creatively incorporate their backgrounds into very, very uh, wonderful ways into a symphonic concert setting. So I hope you enjoyed the concert, and as always, thank you for joining us, and see you later.